Oh, yes. Froggy Fresh taking us into another fresh edition of the Tom Green Podcast because you know what I mean. It's Halloween. And one thing that's scary about the rest of this year for the Lions is the trade of Golden Tate for a third-round pick. However, we will get with that in just a few minutes. Before we oh, actually we'll get started and we'll introduce our returning guests from last year. He is Cody Klontz. He is a fantasy god, seemingly. He is the fantasy commissioner. He is better than Roger Goodell in just about every single way you can imagine. And he is with us on the Tom Green Podcast. Welcome to the Tom Green Podcast, Cody. Great to be back, Tom. Uh, here to defend my crown, and thank you for playing Froggy Fresh to uh, bring us in. Shout out, Bendel High School. Oh, of course. An- another shout out from Bendel High School. Um, I had told Brett this, and I haven't told you yet, but I will on, on air. I actually attend a couple classes at Saginaw Valley State with one of our buddies. He is not the three ball guy. Quote, not the three ball guy, Ray Allen. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's what Brett did kind of mention it to me. But uh, yeah, he was one of the, the OG, the original Bengal guys that we had when I first started coaching over there. So that's pretty cool. Small world, huh? Of course. Now, when it, whenever him and I have a project, or whenever Dr. Bill assigns a project, we both stare at each other and said, Usability Lab, let's go. <laughs> we just know that we're working, we're working together, we're doing this. <laughs> Right. Of course. So I also have to give shout outs to the five major applications that have accepted this podcast. And I'd like to welcome all the new listeners to this podcast. And I'd like to thank Spotify, Radio Public, Breaker, Pocket Casts, and Google Podcasts for accepting this wonderful podcast that I have worked on now for three years. Worked very hard on it, tried to get a lot of guests, some on the small spectrum, some on the bigger spectrum, and this is a big help for those that are on the bigger spectrum that have seen my requests and have ghosted me. I won't name names, but that has happened over the course of the years that I've done this, and now that I'm on the professional line, this is huge, not only for me, but for what's to come in my future. Let alone wants to come in Cody's future if he gets recruited by some Viking company. But this is this is huge, Cody. No doubt, I'm excited for you. It's uh, it's an honor to be a part of the first podcast that will be across all those platforms. And I, uh, like I said, I know you've been working your butt off at it, so it's a, definitely a big step, and that's awesome. Oh, definitely. And he, and of course, earlier this year, I had Jordan on the show, and he. He was scratching his head so many times throughout it, but he was telling me the same thing you just did. But we're working hard, or proud of me, and doing great things on this show. So, thanks again for that, of course, Jordan and Cody. And with that being said, let's move to our Lions Vikings preview, because of course he's a he's a Vikings fan fan that digs it, and he's hooked on a Thielen, if you know what I mean. Of, right. of course. Uh, so, with that being said, let's let's go to the trade deadline real quick. We talked to first to start the show, Golden Tate to the Eagles. I was a bit stunned by this. Let's first hear a, a take from a NFC North foe. That is yours truly, Cody. Uh, tell us about um, this Golden Tate trade. Well, I mean, uh, as someone who's watched Golden Tate torch their team, Ever since he got to Detroit, I absolutely love to see him getting traded the week we were supposed to play you guys. Um, but it's, it was a weird move. Uh, a week ago, they traded for a D-tackle. It seemed like, you know, they filled a, a void that they had on their defense and it seemed like a win-now move. And then a week later, you know, a, a rough loss to Seattle, game they probably should have won at home. And then, you know, it seems like the whole mentality changes and, uh, you know, they're, they're becoming sellers, which... It kind of makes sense when you you know you think about all the MB 
year, but I think, uh, you know, clearing some, some money and, you know, a little bit of, clearing up a little bit of space for Galladay to get some targets and, you know, maybe Theo Riddick get a little bit more involved because he's been kind of a ghost this year and we'll see what happens. Yeah, when I first heard this move, I was shocked. Like I said, I was shocked. I damn near shed a tear because I love Golden Tate. But the thing is, this is part of a business, and that's part of sports, actually, is the fact that prof- professional sports are a business. When you, You'll you have guys that the fans love, like Golden Tate, like Theo Riddick, like Kenny Galladay. And if you're sellers, you get traded and... First, the fan base probably hates Bob Quinn right now, but the fact is, Cody, and I agree with Cody on this, is that if you're not going to re-sign him anyway, and I didn't think Detroit was going to re-sign Golden Tate. I, in fact, I had a strange feeling that Golden Tate was going to become a San Francisco 49er next year because of the way they've been rebuilding with Jimmy Garoppolo. Unfortunately, they've been hurt, and now they're looking like um, they're looking they're looking like the, the team that started 0-9 instead of finishing 5-1 and one to end that season. Actually, 6-1, and one, excuse me. But besides the point, I thought Golden Tate was going to be San Francisco 49er. And the fact that he got traded actually helps Detroit in this sense. They got something for him. If you risk keeping him the rest of this year and not re-signing him, you got nothing for a receiver that you wanted to re-sign. Now that you've traded him for a third-round pick, the chance ha- you so happen to have a chance to re-sign him that I doubt they will do, but if they don't re-sign him, they at least got a third-round pick that they effectively traded last year to get Deshaun Hand. They got that third-round pick back. So basically they, they swapped Deshaun Hand for Golden Tate in the end. Right, which I mean when you look at, you know, some of the, the weaknesses they have on the defensive side of the ball, you know, you wouldn't you wouldn't have hated that trade. And I mean, Sean Hans played out of his mind for for where they drafted him, where you'd expect a, a rookie who was you know not drafted extremely high to, to play. But you know, like you said, it's a move for the future. And I think you know, it looked like the the snacks trade was a move well, was a move for this year. But I think that just kind of sheds a little light that they were actually still, you know, looking more towards the future, even with that trade as well. Because he's, he's the guy that's locked up for a few years, um, at least a few more years. So, you know, all in all, I, I like the moves they've made, uh, you know, especially the Vikings fan, like I said, this week. Love to see Golden Tate not suiting up against them. Um, but, you know, he's a heck of a player, and I know as a Lions fan, it's got to be a little frustrating. Yeah, definitely. I'm sure you saw, you had seen my reaction on Twitter once I heard the move, I put five of the oh, the the uh, like big eyes reaction, and then one teary eyed reaction because I'm like I'm gonna miss Tate. Okay, yeah. that was my same reaction when dare I say this? Jake Rudock threw the pick against Utah to seal that game. Oh, Rudock! <laughs> oh God, it's been a while. <laughs> but that was a few years ago. Um. Well, well, we'll focus now on the Vikings, and they stayed fairly quiet through the trade deadline. However, they made a nice, uh, I, I, I'm not going to say signing, but at least um, when your boy Everson Griffin got his head straightened out, and now he's back on the team. Yeah, literally right. <laughs> but, um, yeah, that, that was something that I wasn't too surprised with the Vikings kind of stand pat at the deadline. Uh, it would have been nice to maybe get a little a line help and or something along those lines, but uh, there wasn't a ton out there, especially with all the bad offensive lines all across the league right now. It's kind of like an epidemic, but it's uh, I wasn't too surprised. And then with Everson coming back, you know, that's that's a big that was a big hit, and that was something you know he's he's not just a, a good player; he's the leader of the locker room. He's something you know the whole defense uh, rallies around him and, and you know plays through his, his energy and positivity. So. Definitely good for him to come back, even though they got to eat up a little bit on Sunday night. When, when the roads are closed, Griffin takes over. <laughs> right. Yeah, Yeah. it'll be nice to have hopefully both come back this week, so we'll see. But Rhodes is, uh, I know I saw he practiced today, so that'll be nice to get him back. And I did notice, I believe it was Don Mitchell from Fox 9 that retweeted it, uh, the Vikings had less than a million dollars in cap space. 
which means that they literally had literally nothing to to work to work with. <laughs> if right, they yeah, they would have had to deal with somebody done. basically, you know, somebody with a decent contract to get any you know significant player uh, without you know completely messing up what they're doing. And that was kind of, I think they kind of knew that when they signed Sheldon Richardson in the offseason. That was kind of their last few uh, their last few dollars in their budget, and you know. We'll definitely see. And that brings us to the next talking point here. Your Vikings. They've been up and they've been up and down so far this year. Do you think they're ready to contend for this first this division and then next for this conference, the NFC? I think they can win the division. I mean, the division's very winnable this year, obviously, with the Bears being up by whatever it is, a, a game or a half a game uh, at this point. Um but as far as the NFC goes, I mean, uh, you, we'll have to see what they look like when hopefully Cook comes back in a couple of weeks fully healthy uh, because they've got to get a run game going if they're going to make any noise. Cousins has been, has been pretty good. Uh, he's had a couple off games. Um, but, you know, he's kept them in a few games, too, where they you know probably should have gotten smacked with like Rams and Green Bay and, uh, you know, kept them above water there. So uh, if they can get a run game going, Cook comes back, get some, you know, continuity on the offensive line and, and figure all that out, then, you know, definitely. With the defense, it's, you know, you can always, defense will travel. So home field's not something that you worry about too much, uh, because that looks like it's probably going to be out of reach the way the Rams and the Saints are playing, especially losing to the Saints last week. Mm-hmm. So, I mean, with that defense, you never know. You can always get hot. Just got to, like I said, I'd like to see the running game uh, show up here eventually. Yeah, and Delvin Cook losing almost two years now with an ACL and a hamstring. Uh, the running game has, just hasn't been solid. Even though Matavius Murray has tried his best, it's... He is starting to pick it up a little bit um, lately. They've been figuring it out. And I did notice that I was watching some NFL fantasy stuff before we got on the show. Uh, one of the stardoms for this week is Latavius Murray, which I did... Well, of course, because I'm a Lions fan, I disagree with, but looking on... Looking at the actual fantasy side, yes, the Lions have allowed a ton of rushing yards and touchdowns right. in the first few games, which I don't like to see, but oh well. <laughs> 32 yeah, teams. I was, nine, actually, like, say, I was kind of surprised to see that too this year with the way their, their secondary has been. I thought that would be the weakness coming into the year um, and that the front seven might be okay other than in the middle uh, until they you know, trade for sacks. But I... Uh, it's definitely surprising to see that how good their secondary is played, so that's part of the reason I'm a little bit worried about this week, so we'll see. And uh, that's another thing I had a lot of so far today is it's Halloween with snacks. And I both have a lot more <laughs> as soon as we get off this podcast. I like snacks. My, my, my body tells me that I like snacks, too, which is perfectly okay for right now. I'm happy, so even though I would like to lose a few LBs, I'm 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 gonna work at it, but anyway. <laughs> I don't know the last Insta post. You're looking pretty svelte, my man. <laughs> Why? Thanks. I I will admit it. Since the hernia surgery, I did kind of let things go a little bit. But once we get back to the groove, probably like before Thanksgiving, I'll get back on, uh, on yeah. track. But anyway, <laughs> you you get it all here on the Tom Green podcast. Not only do you get <laughs> football knowledge that's better than Jordan Bennett. Oops, did I say that on air? Yes, I did. But you also get some personal, some professional personal stuff, like, per se, ourselves. Because that's a podcast. It gets off track, that's good. Right. Exactly. So, Sunday afternoon, around 3 o'clock Minnesota time, how will you be feeling? This is our score prediction question I have for you. Well, like I kind of alluded to, a little bit nervous. Um, Mm -hmm. Partly because the Lions have been good this year after a bad loss, a disappointing loss. Uh, You know, you had the week one. Everybody, you know, that was basically a scheduled win, it felt like. Uh, Mm -hmm. Monday night at home against a rookie quarterback and not a very good team. And, you know, they they blew that, and then they come out and beat the Patriots. So everybody's back on board. They go on the road, lose to Dallas, who had looked pretty bad through the first couple weeks. Uh, And then they come back and beat Green Bay which is, you know, just kind of the way the Lions have been this year. So, mm-hmm. it's you know, it, it makes me a little nervous after a game they probably should have won last week. They're coming out, they go 
going on the road there. The 2-0 in, in the Vikings' new stadium. So I think, uh, you know, it's going to be low scoring. It's going to be close. Line secondary has been better. I think they'll do it just enough to keep Diggs and Thielen in check from, you know, getting out of control. Uh, but I think the Vikings defense come to play at home. Golden Tate being gone is huge. He was the Vikings killer, like we talked about earlier. Mm-hmm. And uh, I'll say 17-13, low scoring. Give me the Vikings. Yeah, and as for week one, I was at that game. It's fair to say from my Twitter, I had a great night. The Lions didn't. <laughs> so, and in Minnesota, like you said, Detroit's 2-0 and at New U.S. Bank Stadium. And Detroit's had some success in Minneapolis besides the 2-0 and record, of course. Um, Detroit is, did, did not look that impressive against Seattle. I was very disappointed by that loss. Golden Tate being gone opens up Kenny Galladay and Marvin Jones. I would start, if you have both of them, I'd maybe, well, I, I may take that back from starting both of them because you have Griffin and Rhodes on both sides. <clears throat> but they're going to have to cover one of them. So the other one's going to definitely be in play. The thing is, is I'm no fantasy expert, I'm not sure which one's going to be the one to play in fantasy. <laughs> they got to get the running game going, and they have the last couple of weeks. As uh, Kerryon Johnson has been the Lions' savior as to, in terms of running rushing yards. I think the Vikings are going to end up pulling this one out, and this is a prove-me-wrong game for our Detroit Lions. If they can win in Minnesota... And they've beaten New England, so they can, they, they've they proven to me that they can beat anybody. But you have to actually beat those teams. If you if you can beat anybody, you got to beat everybody. And let's see. I guess let's see how what go how what will happen here. Vikings 13, Lions 6. Wow. Very low scoring. So we both like the low scoring, and we're both taking the under. <laughs> low scoring, but... Kerryon Johnson gets 95 yards rushing. Adam okay. Thielen gets 101 yards receiving. Just enough to keep the, the streak alive, huh? Just enough to keep the streak alive, which has been very impressive. So, Adam Thielen has also proven to everyone that if you can dream it, you can do it. From being a yeah, Minnesota man. State Mankato and not being looked at by any NFL team, he ends up staying home and being the hero in Minneapolis, yeah. in Minnesota. Get the Minnesotan yeah. accent there. Both of those receivers, too. I mean, Diggs, Diggs was a really top-rated top prospect coming into college. But he had, you know, a ton of injuries. He went to Maryland and, you know, a lot of, uh, not a lot of coverage when, you know, he played for Maryland. They haven't been good in a while. And he, I think he was a fifth-round pick, I want to say. I believe so. So, I mean, you, you know, you've got him and an undrafted uh, Adam Thielen, you know, tearing it up for the Vikings, and that's uh, you know, that's that's good. Rick Spielman's a, I've always liked him. He's always seemed like good moves. They've had a few down years uh, in my life as a Vikings fan, but overall, he's he's a he's a GM. I think he does a great job. And you also like a guy named Ziggy too, not Ziggy Anza, but Ziggy Wolf. Absolutely, the Wolves are awesome. So since you mentioned Maryland, before we get to the Michigan Penn State preview, we got to talk about that because it's been in the news. Uh, we yeah. all know yeah. what I'm, I'm going to mention here, and I think we both <laughs> know how we feel about this. Yes, we are on, and yes, we are on completely wow. opposite ends of the political um, spectrum. But this ain't political. This is moral, and that is Durkin remaining the head coach at Maryland. Tell tell me about I it. Do. Tell I do about. not want to, uh, actually, we're about to break some news. We have this first before anyone else. I just got an update on my phone. From no Yahoo way. Sports. Maryland fires DJ Durkin, reversing course after reinstating coach following an investigation sparked by Jordan Minger staff. Breaking news to the Tom Green podcast. <laughs> Holy cow. Now, this won't be actually be like, updated. I feel like Adam Schefter right now. Just want to say that real quick. Cody Klontz, our, our, <laughs> our savant. Our podcast savant tells us that DJ Durkin has been fired, 
And I should say I'm not surprised by that, and I will say uh, uh, with, this isn't quite breaking news, and it's because it'll take a while for me to actually get this podcast up after we get off the phone. <laughs> However, right, this... We're recording this at 6.40 p.m. on Halloween. <laughs> and for anybody out there. <laughs> this Now, this is a, this is almost like the uh, Zach Smith interview, if you remember uh, watching that in early August. That is, Urban Meyer broke his statement during the ESPN interview with Zach Smith. So this is right. This is this is amazing, actually. <laughs> that <laughs> we got funny. breaking was, news. When you mentioned that we were going to talk about it, the only thing I really had said about it was, you know, I was shocked to see that they kept him. And I was going to say, I don't think it'll be long before the court of public opinion, you know, kind of flexes its muscle and, and, and he's uh, he's long gone. So I guess I guess I was more right than even I thought I would be because. Before I even got to say it, he's done. <laughs> yeah, and, and I guess my only counter for that would be I'm a guy that believes in innocence until proven guilty. But right. the court of public opinion has pretty much stated, and I read it, I do, while I do feel the strength and conditioning coach is more guilty than Durkin is, that don't mean Durkin not guilty. <laughs> Durkin is completely guilty, and Maryland has yeah, righted exactly. its wrong. Because if yeah, I were I Maryland, that, you know, if I were a Maryland player, I, I would I would right. say you know what I ain't playing, I ain't playing yep. till that guy's gone, and I think enough yeah, players think, s- complained yeah. to the board and the com- and the public opinion had complained enough to where they fell to pressure and said you know what Durkin adios. Yeah, I think that's a good point by you too. I know they uh, saw some tweets and stuff yesterday from some. Reporters that had said, you know, they confirmed players were walking out of his first meeting back yesterday after being reinstated. So uh, I think that's a good point by you to say, you know, not just the court of public opinion, but his own players probably, you know, didn't even want him back. And that's that's a that's a telling thing because usually the last people to turn on their coach are the players. Yeah, and that, that's very true. Also, uh, it seemed like they were starting to build something under Matt Canada. Yes, they, they had a couple of bad losses there, one of them to Michigan. Now, of course, Michigan not being a bad loss, but how, how bad they lost by, I mean by that. But they beat Texas under Matt Canada. Yeah. And yeah. I, I think if I were Maryland, I would have I would just let Matt, let Matt Canada be the, be the new coach. Yeah, I agree. I think they will. At least they're definitely going to give him the interim tag at I mean, you know, Kansas. So, I mean, no surprise there. But I, I think he's a pretty, pretty good coach. I think he does some different things on the offensive side of the ball. That They have some good quarterbacks. I like both the quarterbacks they have. That I've watched them pair up Texas two years in a row. And Michigan, kind of a little bit different of a story. But, but yeah, I, I think they have some talent there. And with them, you know, you want to keep some, you know, at least the one Mar- the one former Maryland guy that's doing the greatest right now, even though his team isn't, Randy Edsel at UConn. Because if you've seen the stories, bonus for if he scores first. Bonus if he has a lead after halftime. Bonus if he wow. does this. Bonus if this <laughs> happens. It's like, I haven't where, seen any of that, where can I cool. sign the dotted line there at UConn? That is happening a great agent right there. <laughs> Jake from State Fromm. <laughs> Known as Fromm, not Farm. Well, of course, if you've listened to former podcasts, we'll hit that towards the rapid fire segment. But that was that was probably the most interesting segment in Tom Green podcast history. Right there was the breaking of the firing of DJ Durkin. <laughs> as we I don't know if you've ever yeah, broken live news like that, but you have now. <laughs> Please credit the Tom Green podcast. You need to start treating people out when they uh, when they break that story in the next couple minutes. Oh, definitely. And <laughs> I guess now I have now I have a reel for when professionals take a look at how does he react to breaking news. Well, there's a there's a reaction for you. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> Got to be prepared for whatever comes my way. Yeah. yeah so that being well, well done, like a true pro. <laughs> exactly. So that being said, and of course Jenny's a true pro. We've talked about Jenny Taft before, how I've networked with her a few times. Besides the point, let's go to Michigan Penn State. If you saw my tweet earlier today, I mimicked the Harbaugh reaction to the personal foul 
in 2015 against Penn State, a.k.a. when he took his coat off on the sidelines and starts starts yelling at the ref. <laughs> yeah, that was, a, that was a classic. That was one of the best, for sure. And the reason why I did that was actually not because we're playing Penn State. It was because... For some reason, I was I was not able to find my classic Michigan Harbaugh M hat. So I'm like, well, how do I pull off Harbaugh without the hat? Penn State 2015. <laughs> Mom, take a picture. It's on my Twitter. <laughs> so as for Michigan and Penn State, Michigan, my my message to the Wolverines, being ranked number five in the nation, stay on course. Don't look at that. I know you're excited. I know that one of Alabama and LSU will probably drop out of the top four because one of them is going to lose. This is not the NFL. There are no ties in the NFL. Or, I mean, no ties in college. Excuse me. There are ties in the NFL. There have been seemingly every week. But no ties in college football. One team is going to lose. Even if it's Alabama, one team is going to drop out of this top four. Do I think Alabama will come back into the top four with a loss? Yes. Do I think they will drop out of the top four to start out with? Actually, yes. And it's because you have you have a few teams on the waiting list like Michigan, Georgia. Dare I say this, Kentucky, if they beat Georgia. You have teams on the waiting list that want to be there. Alabama is right there, too, and looks dominant. And if they lose, who knows what will happen. So, uh, Michigan-Penn State. Well, first, Cody, go ahead and give us your thoughts on that, too. Oh, yeah, you're right. You got to uh, hit him with the old Nick Saban, uh, avoid the rat poison that is the, the hype that you hear on Twitter and Facebook or whatever, you know, Instagram, all that good stuff. So, the Bill I Belich- think they will. The Bill we'll Belichick Instaface. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> so... Stay on course and don't let Penn State get confident because when Penn State was not confident, Michigan State happened. When Penn State was confident, Ohio State almost happened. But they got a little too confident and Franklin called a play that confused the hell out of just about all of us on fourth down. Yeah, no doubt. Yeah, that was questionable. So with that being said, Saturday at around 7 o'clock, how will things go? How, how are you feeling? How will you be feeling Saturday at 7 o'clock? Well, I think the most important thing in this game, at least the last two times, has been home field advantage. You've had the home team win an absolute blowout in the last two games. And I think it comes to, make, I think it comes to you know, it'll be a factor again this year. I think it lifts Michigan's defense. Uh, which you'll need. Um, it would be great to get Rashawn Gary back, but as crazy as it sounds, I think it actually helps our pass rush with him out because Uche has been uh, off so far in his absence. So I Uche, think Uche, that pass Uche, rush against Nick Soley, which would, would be huge. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah, that's something we didn't really have last year. Rashawn's great against the run, definitely one of the top 10 defensive linemen in the country, um, but Uche has just got that speed off the edge that I think gives tackles problems. Uh, I'd like to see us use him. I mean, you know, then it comes down to our quarterback that you know we didn't have the last couple years. I think Shea gets it done. Uh, he's exactly what they need. Where he's, he can manage the game, but he's also you know he makes plays too. He does with his legs. He makes you know uh, sometimes some some throws into tight windows that you don't think you should throw it at first, and uh, you know he makes a play. He makes it happen. So I'll say Michigan thirty-one twenty-one. And the thing that frustrated me two years ago was that Penn State ran out of linebackers. We won that game 49-10. to And yet Penn State was one play away from winning a Rose Bowl. Again, they were out of linebackers. We won 49-10. to They go to the Big Ten Championship. They win it. They go to the Rose right. Bowl, and we're stuck on the sidelines. Now, granted, we lost to Ohio State. They beat Ohio State. Fair enough. But still, we shellacked that team every which way you can, 
and yet they go to the Rose Bowl and we don't. Yeah, that was the big argument back then, too. The only thing I kind of have to say with mine is we did get off a little easy. I think Straquan was coming back from, like, an injury, so he was at, like, you know, he was not at full strength when they played us. See, I don't think he played, you know, the whole game. Uh, That's part true. of that had to be because of the blowout as well. But once he got healthy, that team changed uh, towards the end of that year, and then you saw last year they were just a, a force that we didn't stand a chance on the road. So yeah, I think, uh, you know, it's a little, two different teams this year. For sure, I think you know the dynamic of losing him, where he's you know the best playmaker in college football last year for sure on offense, and and we're getting you know we gained Shea, which is a, a a huge huge upgrade over what we had at quarterback the last year. And a little fun factoid here: my puppy Callie is her name. Just came out to the set, heard my uh, rant about them running out of linebackers and wanted to console me a little bit. Now I'm petting her a little bit. Kind of like a Percy's probably in your car right now as <laughs> as we're recording. I know it. I know it, puppy. They ran out of linebackers. I know. As for this game, I think... Believe it or not, and I may sound crazy, which a lot of networkers know I am, but besides the point, I think you're going to see another 49-10 to victory. I think Michigan's going to come out and just dominate. I mean, Penn State has a chance. If Penn, if Penn State scores first, this is going to be like a 27-20 game. If Michigan scores first, Michigan's going to just blow them out of the water. Kind of like last year at Penn State two years ago, Michigan. But I think, I think you're going to see either a blowout or a very close game. And if my gut's telling me blow out, go blue. I love it. So with that being said, we go to the most heralded segment on the show. And for new listeners, this is probably the best segment on the show. We do our game previews. And then we preview games around the nation. We call it rapid fire, but it isn't really such rapid fire. Now since our guest claims he's the champion... He claimed he was a champion, so I played that for him. So how the game works? How the game works is I'm going to give Cody the games. We have nine on the slate, and he's going to tell me who's going to win. And each guest throughout the season has a tab, whether you know they go eight and zero, zero and eight, whatever. Highest winning percentage at the end of the year wins a small prize from yours truly. Now, last week we had a new leader, Rob Smith. Went 7-2, has a 777 winning percentage, which topped the 750 of Jordan Bennett, Robin, Robert Wilson. And I'm actually glad he did that, and it's because in, I believe it was Jordan Bennett's week, one of the rapid-fire games was a tie. And I thought to myself, oh, geez, if it comes down to that tie... I don't know how I'm going to deal with this. But thankfully, somebody overtook him. I don't have to worry about that anymore. Now, hopefully this won't be the same this week, but we'll see what happens. All right, let's do it. Let's get this party started. First, we got Jake from State From Georgia against Benny Snell and Kentucky. SEC Nation is going to be there. I uh, I am going with the road team. I'm taking Georgia. Probably the uh, uh, you know, the popular pick this week, given Kentucky being kind of the team you're not used to seeing up in the top ten in football, at least. Uh, more of a basketball school there. So I'm going to take Georgia. I think the really experience, big games. Uh, I think they'll be able to go on the road and steal one. I uh, Give us a score real quick. Okay. I see this game playing out very similar to how the Kentucky and A&M game played out, where A&M looked like the better team, and Georgia is going to be looking like the better team. Kentucky is going to play around for three and a half quarters, and then 
I think Georgia's just going to take over. Even if it goes overtime, I do like Georgia and Jake from State Farm in this game. What am I wearing? Khakis. It's 3 a.m. It's Jake from State Farm. 34-31. Your other favorite team, not West Virginia, but they're playing the Mountaineers, playing... Uh, Tom Herman's Texas. Yeah, I'm gonna. I'm tempted to take West Virginia here uh, because I've seen Texas in the last so five years or so, and I've seen them do this a couple times where they had a good win, maybe beat Oklahoma, get everybody excited. Um, they had the loss last week where you think you know that's the letdown there, and then that was kind of a trap game for. For this, I think, because I think they might have been looking ahead a little bit uh, to hosting West Virginia. So I think Texas is actually a little bit different this year. I think they're a little mentally tougher than they've been in years past. So I'm going to take them at home. I'll take them by a late field goal uh, to win it by the, by the kicker. The kicker, the kicker. The kicker. Hashtag college kickers. <laughs> Tom Herman said it best last year. Reporter, and I forget who the reporter was, asked him, how do you know your team is getting better when we win a game we're not supposed to? They won that game they weren't supposed to against Oklahoma. They lost the game they really weren't supposed to against Oklahoma State, but when you go on the road at night, as Michigan is known, bad things happen. With that being said, West Virginia, we haven't heard a lot about West Virginia so far this year, except for... Tennessee, of course. Will Greer has played well. Uh, Dana Holgerson still has the bald spot on his head, if I'm not mistaken. It shines. Um, I think hair proceeds, and Dana Holgerson really doesn't have a lot of it on the top of his head. Will Greer does. Dana Holgerson doesn't. Will Greer throws for 350 yards. Shane Buchel throws for 400 and runs for 200. Give me Texas fifty-one to forty-eight. Big what is defense twelve? <laughs> this one isn't ranked versus ranked, but it was a close line, so I threw it in. Boston College and Virginia Tech. I saw that one. That weird game. I haven't watched much of these teams this year, especially after Virginia Tech lost their QB. They had uh, an Ann Arbor guy was the quarterback. Jackson, he ended up going down, I think, first game of the year. They really haven't been the same since. And, and Virginia Tech stuff. lost. They got some athletes. Yeah. I like the uh, the running back, Dylan. They got a good, you know, their, their quarterback plays better this year. So uh, I'll take Boston College on the road. I think they're uh, they're tough enough to, to go out and steal one on the road. And Virginia Tech lost to a team that, to, a, to the school that my cousin goes to, Old Dominion. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Justin Fuente is doing a decent job there, but I think he's hit the sophomore slump. Uh, Steve Adazio has been there, what, six years now? And he's had the luxury of Don Brown for a couple of those years. But BC's defense has played decent, even though they lost Don Brown. Um, BC's a running team. BC's got experience, even though they're doing a little better than, than they really should be. But the... Desmond Howard even said that BC could crash the college football playoff, which I thought, whoa, whoa, there, Des. But they are ranked, and I'll give them that. Give me BC 27-20. Lower scoring in that one. I don't think I give you a score, so I'll say 21-20. 21-20, okay. A very interesting independent versus Big Ten matchup. We all know which one I'm going to say. Notre Dame and Northwestern. Yeah, I was surprised to see that was that was this week. I think I saw it last weekend, and was uh, you yeah, know surprised to see them playing this kind of this late in the year. But with Notre Dame, I guess you can't really be too surprised. Mm-hmm. I'm gonna, the theme of my uh, the theme of my pick this week, I guess, is, is road teams because I'm taking another one. I'm taking Notre Dame. Uh, I think they just have too many athletes. I think it'll be close. Northwestern will definitely keep it close. Gerald will have them ready to go. Uh, he always does for the big games. Their, their defense will be good. Um, but Notre Dame will just pull away in the second half. I think just be kind of like Michigan did to them this year, where the, the better team will just kind of wear them down and win it late. 
I'll we'll get it. We'll, we'll get it. I'll say 27, 27-17 uh, Notre Dame. Guess what? Not so fast, my friend. <laughs> In the words of Pat Fitzgerald, go Cats. <laughs> Notre Dame, this looks like the 2012 team all over again. Sure, they might go undefeated, but if they do reach the playoff, they're going to get destroyed by whoever they play. I'm sorry, Ben Belden, that I'm saying that on this high of a stage, but I think it's going to happen. Go you, Northwestern, fight for victory. Uh, let's see the uh, um, Mike Golick photo again like we did four years ago after Northwestern beat Notre Dame. I'm sure you remember that, Cody. Northwestern 31, Notre Dame 27. I got to be bold. I hate to see it at all. It hurts Michigan's resume a little bit, but at this point, attack. <laughs> I like to be bold sometimes, and I just went bold there. Alabama LSU. I'm going to go. I, I I can't pick against Alabama this year. I love Coach O. Love LSU. Uh, you know, it's a night game. You don't go into that valley at night and come away with the easy win. I think two is going to actually have to play in the fourth quarter. Um, so I think it'll be closer than any any game Alabama's played this year. And I think they win a, a close game, um, but they pull away at the end. I'll say, uh, I'll say 24 10. Before LSU and Arkansas. <laughs> You know I love Coach O. Just about every week he's been on the the rapid fire segment. I gotta I gotta throw up my Coach O impersonation because we hold that tiger and we love the tigers here at the Tom Green Podcast. And I think that I gotta go with the Tigers because it's at night. It's in Death Valley and Alabama. Tua hasn't had a tough test yet besides a national championship. Give me LSU. 27 or 17 14. Defense of battle. Tom, I think that was an unintentional great Harry Carey impersonation. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I can do Harry Carey too. I just had to have a few beers in me. That was like Will Ferrell's Harry Carey. I think it was perfect. <laughs> Oh, but I love Coach O. If you don't love Coach O, you're crazy. No doubt. He is a, he is an absolute uh, quote machine. Everything he says, I just, it's, everything he says makes me laugh, and not on purpose. It's just the way he says it, and go Tigers at the end of every sentence. Go Tigers. He's a football guy, football guy to the core. Football guy, just like Ben Mason. I'm big and I like to hit people. Football Very guy. True. LSU 17, Alabama 14. Let's shake up the college football playoff a little bit. Yeah, that would make things very interesting. I think if, if, if Alabama loses like that, I don't see them dropping very far uh, because I think they'll get the of the doubt like they usually do. Kind of the, uh, the Ohio mm-hmm. State uh, type deal there where even if they you know have the same resume as teams in the same time as they might have beat them head-to-head, they're going to get that benefit of the doubt at the end of the year when it comes down to it. So, let's move on to the NFL. Falcons, Redskins. Yeah, tough game to pick. Uh, the Falcons defense has been terrible after being pretty good for the last few years. I know that's pretty beat up injury-wise, I think, uh, as well. But I'm going to take another road. You want to take Atlanta. Uh, like the passing game, Washington secondary has been strong. and They bolstered it with a uh, high, high Clinton Dix, but... I think Atlanta, I think, uh, you know, a lot of averages, they got eight things like that. I think they're better than their record says, uh, and they're going to win some games that, you know, they probably shouldn't. Kind of like Dallas, honestly. Right. 
So with that being said, oh, score, by the way, score prediction. Oh, shoot, give me Atlanta 20-17. I think that it's going to take a little bit for Hashan Haha Quentin Dix to um, get into the lineup. Yeah, yep, you can go ahead and laugh. You're, I know you're laughing inside. But um, I think it's going to take a while for him to get used to the Washington's defensive scheme rather than Green Bay's. And I think it's going to hurt him this week. I like Atlanta close, but I think it's a little higher scoring than that because Atlanta's defense is, in fact, terrible. Give me like 31-24, something like that, Atlanta. I like it. The uh, Demarius Thomas Bowl, Houston, Denver. Yeah, another interesting game with that whole trade going on this week. Uh, got to wonder what's going, with, <laughs> what's going on with Denver. Guys, they've got to be worried about what he's going to you know, be saying. And uh, you got to wonder if they're going to switch things up on offense. And I see two teams. Trending in different directions. Houston getting better, uh, you know, getting a little more confidence every week, and Denver losing confidence, losing confidence in Case Keenum and the offense as a whole. As you can see, they're you know they're starting to sell at the deadline, uh, which is not something I think when they signed Keenum that they intended on doing. Um, I thought you know they they probably expected to compete for that division, uh, but you know they turned into sellers. So I'm going to take Houston on the road, another road team. Uh, probably crazy if I you to get a bunch of these picks on taking some of the 18s on the road. I'll take Houston big. I'll take them like 34, uh, 14. If Deshaun Watson can stay healthy, I think the Texans win the AFC South. Unfortunately, I'm kind of selling out on the Jags, even though I like their defense, because Tyler, of course, drafted them for me as a joke, and I've turned it into something that's said that's made me say the joke's on him. But besides the point... Um, Houston's trending in the right direction. Deshaun throwing for as many touchdowns as I have fingers and a thumb on my hand last week against Miami. And he could potentially do that again despite Von Miller. Give me Houston 41, Denver 24. I think Denver made a big mistake by trading Demarius, but if they're selling for the future, perhaps I could be wrong. I agree. I, 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 we'll see with Colton Sutton, too. You know, they, they drafted him pretty high this year, and he kind of figured something was going to happen with those receivers. They had some big contracts and uh, shoddy quarterback play. They kind of wasted their prime years. So they're making some moves now to, to switch it up. But, but I agree with you. I think Houston's, you know, like we said, the team trending upwards, Denver not so much. Sutton is that fantasy stealer, I call him, kind of like uh, Raheem Mostert in San Francisco. Yeah. You thought Morris was going to play? Eh, eh. Nope, Mostert. I'm stealing your fantasy points. That's what Cortland Sutton's doing in Denver, too. Chargers and Seattle. You know the deal. Another road team. I am taking the Chargers. I uh, I think they're just a the better team. Hopefully, Melvin Gordon's back this week. I think he's supposed to be. Uh, so I think he's supposed to be questionable. Uh, so I'll tend to play, take the Chargers. Uh, I think they win easily if Melvin Gordon plays and, and looks, you know, uh, looks healthy. I'll say it should be one ten. I think they uh, shut Seattle down. This one is very interesting because Seattle is looking like a better football team than I thought they would against Detroit. Their offensive line looked better, but of course, who knows? Because Detroit's defense has been a total mystery so far this year. If the Chargers come out like Detroit did last week, I could see Seattle winning big at home. If the Chargers defense come, uh, comes into play as advertised, I could see a close Charger victory. Give me like 23-20 Chargers. And our final rapid fire game in this segment, the big one, America's Game of the Week. Rams, Saints. So this is, I think, only the second home team I'm going to pick. Um, but I was kind of on this, this wave last week, too. I, I was kind of picking that I thought the Packers uh, might go into L.A. and upset the Rams because it's just, Boo. well, they, eventually they're going to lose the game. I don't think they're going 16-0. Uh, and I think, you know, going into New Orleans, New Orleans is hot right now. That was a big win for them last week in Minnesota and kind of uh, avenging last year's demons from the playoffs. And uh, I think the mojo is, you know, getting Ingram back to a few weeks ago was big for them. And they've, you know, they've gone back to being run heavy, which I think makes them dangerous with, mm-hmm. with Ingram and Kamara. And then you, you can use Breeze as a game manager, which uh, it's going to be hard to find a better game manager than that. 
The Rams are going to suffer a loss sometime in the season that will, in fact, make them a better football team. We've seen this story before. You think it comes this week against New Orleans? I actually think it comes. I actually think it comes twice this year. First against the Chiefs in Mexico City. I think the Chiefs are going to win that game, and it's because usually the Chiefs are firing on all cylinders towards the end of the regular season. And so far they've been firing on all cylinders the whole season. But at some point they will falter, but I think that they will beat the Rams, and the Rams will learn from that loss. The second time, but really the first time, I think that they have this learning loss, comes this week at the Dome in New Orleans. You go to the Dome, it's loud. When it's loud, you can't hear. When you can't hear, bad things happen. When bad things happen, so do losses. So when you when you go to the Dome, and by the transitive property, when you go to the Dome, a loss happens. Give me the Saints, who dat, 54-51. Good Lord. This is going to be like Giant Saints two years ago where... You might want to draft an entire team of just Rams and Saints on DraftKings. Because you might win. Yeah. You might win if you do that. It's possible. I mean, I, I do like the Rams uh, front seven still. I like that D-line. I think they'll, you know, they'll, they'll cause some problems for New Orleans run game. That's why I kept it a little bit less strong, but still 34-31. Uh, you know, is what I'm thinking right around there. That's still, that's still a pretty high scoring game. Oh, Lions, this could have been your defensive line, but in Quinn we trust. With that being said, that is our rapid-fire segment. And, of course, Cody, the one more question I have for you is, as always, do you have anything else to add to this spectacular Tom Green podcast? Just uh, appreciate you having me, and like we talked about, keep up the the great work and, and doing what you're doing, man. Only getting better. I appreciate it, my friend. We're 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 kind of like the Lions. We're 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 building towards the future, and the future is bright. Exactly. The future is exactly. bright. There we go. He is Cody Klontz. He is the fantasy savant and the Adam Schefter of this podcast. Now that we found out that Durkin's been fired, and this has been a great addition nationally of the Tom Green podcast. <laughs>